Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Tuesday, July 2nd, we are studying Esther chapter 9, verses 1 to 19. In today's text, the 13th day of the 12th month arrives. This is the day that the king's first edict had appointed for the slaughter of God's people. It's also the day that the king's second edict has appointed for God's people to defend themselves. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor James Preuss. Pastor Preuss serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Ottumwa, Iowa. Pastor Preuss, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Thank you. As we get started today, Pastor Preuss, give us some context. What should we know about the book of Esther and what's been happening leading up to chapter 9? Well, the book of Esther is uh, it's the story that explains the historical institution of the festival of Pur- Purim. Uh, how do you say it? Is it Purim? Purim. I think I, I, I I've only said the word pu- pur or pure so far, which comes up back in chapter three. So Purim, Purim, I don't know. You I think it's Purim. Okay. Okay. That works. I'm, I'm going to say Purim because that sounds more American. Uh, although if <laughs> okay. I were read it in Hebrew, I think I'd say Purim. Well, it, it's a festival even today among, among the Jews. So the whole book of Esther, all 10 chapters, really serves to uh, to explain the historical institution of this festival. So Purim comes from the Persian word for lots, uh, because Haman, back in chapter 3, which I'm sure you guys talked about, uh, Haman is the prime minister or the or the vizier of the Persian emperor Ahasuerus, uh, and he cast lots in chapter 3 uh, for the year, or for the, the month and the day, to determine uh, what would be the best uh Day to execute his plot to destroy the Jews. So he is angry at the Jews because he's been promoted to this incredible high office. The only person who is above him in the entire empire is Ahasuerus, the emperor. And uh, everyone is commanded to bow down to him, but Mordecai, the Jew, does not bow down to, uh, to Haman. So he decides that he wants to kill uh, all of the Jews, and as kind of a way of like communicating with the the divinities, the false gods, mm-hmm. he makes this. Uh, he casts these lots. So today is pretty much it's the battle of the gods, uh, Haman's uh, false gods versus the the one true God. Although he is not mentioned by name. So if we were to to picture, uh, oh, then of course you have Esther who is the queen. She's the cousin of Mordecai. Mordecai is her foster father. And, uh, she lives in the, in the palace. And, uh, she is, uh, uh, well, she's an important character because she, uh, helps save, save the Jews, but it's by Mordecai's direction. So Mordecai puts her in there, uh, Mordecai, through her, rescues Ahasuerus from being assassinated by some eunuchs I think he had. Um, And then, uh, of course, now she's the one who invites this feast. So uh, a couple chapters earlier, she invites Haman and Ahasuerus to this this feast. And then that's when she exposes uh, Haman's plot. So if we were to picture the plot of Esther as like a large wave uh, and were to place this pericope somewhere on the wave, this would be like right at the pinnacle, but like the right half of, well, my, my way is going from left to right. Like the, the end of the pinnacle, uh, like right as the water is starting to turn white and is going to just plunge down uh, into the trough. So uh, this uh, pericope shows the failure of Haman's Purim uh, in favor of, of what Mordecai has done. Because what has happened is uh, Mordecai has replaced... Uh, Haman's office. He is now in Haman's office, uh, and he is now going to. Uh, uh, he's he has written a decree for the king to to send out to counteract Haman's, and this is it being executed. So you have the two. This is the day yeah. that the two uh, 
edicts, one written by Haman and the other written by Mordecai, both of which are being carried out in the name of Ahasuerus, are going to clash. And we're going to see which one uh, overpowers the other. Uh, so the festival of Purim, we, you'll get it in the next pericope that I'll actually talk about by name. Uh, it is mentioned in the Apocrypha in Second Maccabees uh, uh, as Mordecai's day, but it's but neither Esther nor Purim, the festival, is mentioned in the New Testament. Uh, but it is widely celebrated today, and you'll see it in the media, and they talk about their their feast. So it usually falls in February or March. Right. Yeah. So this is again the the last month of the calendar for the the sacred calendar of the Old Testament. The month of Adar is when this is happening. Just to, uh, on a comment that you made there, Pastor Preuss, about the the casting of lots that Haman does, and sort of a, a battle of the gods to think about it like that. One of the the features of the Book of Esther that we've talked about before that certainly continues into this text is the reality that God is not mentioned by name in the Book of Esther. Yet I think that's a, a helpful way to think about the book is this battle of the gods, especially in connection with the the Purim that are cast. Talk a little bit more about that reality with God not being named by es- in the Book of Esther, but still being the the driver of all the events. Yeah, and this is it's it's interesting. I, I was reading up about this a little bit um, from Kyle Dalich uh, uh, about the authorship of of Esther and its acceptance into the canon. And the fact that it doesn't mention God by name has been troublesome for a lot of people. And I'll even admit it's been a little bit troublesome for me. Like, why isn't God mentioned? Uh, This is very different from the rest of the books of the Bible. It has even caused some to question whether it should be in the canon, uh, including Luther. Uh, That being said, it has really strong basis for being in the canon of Scripture. It, It was included very, very early on. Uh, and uh, almost just unanimously. So we we should be treating it as scripture. Uh, and the fact that it has such a glaring oddity uh, and yet is still uh, strongly attested to be in scripture, I think it gives even more uh, more strength uh, for its can- canonicity. Um, sure. So I guess what I would say is you see God in it. It's just like in, in our day. I mean, you think about the evolutionists. And Mm -hmm. they don't believe, or not some of them do, but uh, the atheistic evolutionists, they don't believe God exists. And, you know, we're looking at the same world, we're looking at the same evidence, and you and I look at it and we say, well, God obviously does exist. I mean, these things, you have, uh, you know, uh, irreducible parts. Like if you you break down a plant, (laughs) I mean, it's it's a complex... uh, structure that if you break it down it all falls apart and they can't these things can't exist independent of each other the same with with uh the the biology of the mammals and the other animals uh you know there's so many things that are in place that could not be in place unless they were all put together at the same time by an intelligent creator so we see uh the the creation uh the creator and the creation uh and and uh, when we read scripture, that's what we do as well. And we read scripture according to the analogy of faith. So, you know, basically, you know, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed tell you how to read scripture. And so you're able to recognize the Son of God in the Old Testament, uh, in the angel of the Lord, uh, and so forth. And you're able to recognize uh, the the foretelling of Christ's birth in Isaiah 7, uh, <clears throat> because this is what scripture as a whole teaches. So you can't read Esther without knowing that God is there. Uh, and I, I would say that's how I would explain it. And you see God in action in how Mordecai behaves and, and how Esther behaves as well. Uh, and also how he moves Ahasuerus to work. And then you also see Satan in the work of Haman and, and the other enemies of God's people. Yeah, we, we've talked about that in the past, how this is more than just a, say, a personal conflict between Haman and Mordecai, but there is a reality of the the conflict between the the enemy of God's people, the devil, and the, the offspring of the woman going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, how the Lord said there would be enmity between her offspring and the devil's offspring. We're seeing that reality play out 
as the people of God are attacked by the enemies of God's people. And as you said, here we have reached the day. There is these two competing edicts that are both legal, that are both going to happen now on this the 13th day of the 12th month. So let's turn to the text. This is Esther chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. Now in the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, on the 13th day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm, and no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all peoples. All the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews, for the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces, for the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. The Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. In Susa the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, and also killed Parshanantha, and Dalphan, and Aspatha, and Poratha, and Adalia, and Aridatha, and Parmashta, and Arasai, and Aridai, and Vaisatha, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. But they laid no hand on the plunder. That very day, the number of those killed in Susa the citadel was reported to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, In Susa the citadel, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men, and also the 10 sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. And Esther said, If it please the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to this day's edict, and let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. The Jews who were in Susa gathered also on the fourteenth day of the month of Adar, and they killed three hundred men in Susa, but they laid no hands on the plunder. Now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives, and got relief from their enemies, and killed 75,000 of those who hated them. But they laid no hands on the plunder. This was on the thirteenth day of the month of Adar, and on the fourteenth day they rested and made that day that a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the thirteenth day and on the the fourteenth, and rested on the fifteenth day, making that a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages who live in the rural towns hold the 14th day of the month of Adar as a day for gladness and feasting, as a holiday, and as a day on which they send gifts of food to one another. That's our text for today. That's Esther chapter 9, verses 1 to 19. Pastor Price, as the chapter gets started again, we learn what day it is. It is the 12th month. It is the 13th day of that month got the king's command and edict about to be carried out. Just remind us of the context of these two competing edicts that the king has issued that land on this day. Right. So, well, first, I just want to say that, uh, so when I do Bible studies on Sunday morning, sometimes I'll read the text, and sometimes I'll ask, you know, the attendants to read it, uh, the, the people who are attending, usually based on whether I need to get another cup of coffee or not. And, uh, <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll ask them to read it, and there'll be a text like this, and you have all these impossible names to say, and then I feel really bad that I set them up for... <laughs> but you did a really good job reading all those names. These, uh, these, what, I guess they're Persian names in this text? Or it's, it is, you know, when you do yeah. read the scriptures like this and you pronounce especially the names out loud, you start to, to see these were, are more difficult to, to come across than, yeah. say, some of the Hebrew names, a little more familiar with those having studied Hebrew. These definitely stand out as like, whoa, what are those? So... Anyways, yeah, yeah, they they are more they're more difficult even than the Hebrew names. That's true. That's right. All right. <clears throat> so if you go back to Esther chapter three, and uh, your listeners may may remember this is probably a while ago that you talked about it. Uh, but Haman's upset at Mordecai, and he wants to destroy the Jews. So what he does, uh, so it says in the first month of the month of Nisan, this is on verse seven, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, 
So we actually are able to kind of tell what, what year this is, because when does Ahasuerus's reign start? Uh, 486, so the 12th year, so what's that? 474 BC, uh, around there is when this is happening. And Nisan being the first month, so we're talking about like March or April. Uh, so they cast poor, that is, they cast lots before Haman day after day, and they cast it month after month until the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there's a certain, there are certain people scattered abroad, dispersed among the people. Anyway, so he talks about how terrible they are. And then he says that they will, uh, he will uh, make, he says, please, uh, if it please the king, let a decree be made to destroy them, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have ch- uh, charge of the king's business. So pretty much what he's going to do is have them go out and destroy them uh, and uh, plunder them and then use that plunder to pay the king's treasury. So, I mean, it's, that's how he's convincing King Ahasuerus, who isn't a particularly moral person, uh, that where he just says, okay, well, that sounds good. So then verse 13, it says, letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces. Now, remember, there are 127 provinces that stretch from uh, Egypt, no, from Ethiopia, all the way to India. So this is a huge area that these have to spread out to with instructions to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. And a copy of this document was sent to all the pro- provinces. So obviously that would have taken some time. So then, of course, we know the story. Haman overplays his hand. Uh, Esther exposes his evil plot, and then she... Uh, uh, then he's hanged on the gallows that he made, or a, a tree, a pole uh, that he made for Mordecai. And then Mordecai is placed into Haman's uh, position. And then Mordecai makes another decree. And you can read about that in verse 8, or chapter 8, where he says, uh, let's see here. So he says, uh, Right, so he says, right, what please you to say the Jews? Let's see here. Oh, well, uh, okay, so that's that's their thing. So, why don't they just rescind right. Haman's uh, edict? That's what's kind of what we find to be strange. Well, a story that you might know a little bit better is the story of Daniel. Remember when Darius comes to power, who's probably Cyrus, and he gets again, they kind of stroke his ego, and he writes a decree that anyone who prays to any other God except for him uh, will be thrown into the lion's den. That's how it works, right? Yeah. And then uh, when when he finds out that's Daniel, he doesn't have the authority to say, no, okay, you guys tricked me. I'm not sending Daniel my my best and most highly uh, uh, you know statured servant uh, into the lion's den, I pardon him. He doesn't have the authority, according to the Medes and the Persians. So this is very much the same thing. So the king can't undo the edict that he does, so he has to then make another edict uh, to protect them. So the one that Mordecai has is saying that on the same day uh, that the Jews are allowed to defend themselves, which is why this is such a kind of a huge pericope to to deal with. Because if you've never read this story before, you're like, okay, uh, it. <laughs> who's going to win? And that's why I said yeah. before, it's like the battle of the gods. Haman cast his lots, and his gods, from what he understood, according to the lot, said, this is the day that will not fail. Well, Haman's dead now, so they're, you know, so we, we know what's going to happen. But will the gods uh, carry out what they told Haman through these lots, or will Mordecai's god conquer and grant them the victory. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is th- this is that day that was decreed in both edicts. Which one is going to to win is kind of the question. Although as you said, the fact that Haman has been executed on the gallows that he prepared for Mordecai has maybe set the stage that when we see the way the text plays out, that it is the the self-defense of the people of God against their enemies that holds the day. Perhaps we're not too surprised in that sense that, you know, we, we've seen the way that, again, the Lord working in the background 
has worked things out, you know, again, in the, the conflict, especially between Mordecai and Haman, such that now when that conflict escalates to the, the peoples at large, maybe we're not terribly surprised that it goes the way that it does. Right. Well, and, and like I talked about this being the climax, there there really are two climaxes in this uh, story. The one is, is King Ahasuerus going to side with Haman, his, right. uh, his prime minister, or is he going to side with his wife? Who, by the way, like he doesn't really have that high of a, a view of his wives. He has lots right. of wives, but it shows that I mean, God used her beauty and charm to win him over. Uh, so it worked out. So I, I do have a theological point to make. I don't know if you want to save it until the end or for just no, just go ahead, go ahead, make it now. Theological yeah. points here. Okay, yeah, that's <clears throat> that sounds like a better thing. So why is this? I I find it a, a bit difficult that uh, that he has this this rule that you can't just undo what Haman did, that you can't just veto it and then place, uh, and then have uh, Mordecai's edict put there instead. Right. And I think like this, what is this, this whole book really teaches about? It teaches us about the church militant and that we are, obviously our battle is not physical as they have here, but we battle against, you know, the principalities against the powers of the air as uh, St. Paul talks about in Ephesians 6. So we have to put on the whole armor of God. Uh, so there is a connection here we see. We don't always understand <clears throat> why God permits things to happen. Uh, like, why doesn't God just lock up Satan? Like, we were talking about this on Sunday. We were going through those uh, What About series uh, mm -hmm. that Al Berry put together. I think Paul McCain wrote them. Um, and we're talking about demons. You know, what about angels? We're talking about demons. It was kind of like, well, what? Wait, wait, I don't get it. Is Satan in hell? I'm like, well, he's like on earth, but he's injured. Why doesn't God just send Satan to hell? Like, why Why do we have to deal with Satan now? Why do we have to deal with, with the devil? Why do we have to deal with sin, death, and everything? Why can't we just be in, be in heaven now? I don't know. That really is part of the hidden wisdom of God. Uh, so what God does is he doesn't take away these trials Instead, he gives us the equipment to deal with them. So it's like the snakes in the wilderness. So God sends these snakes to bite the people of Israel, and then they're dying, and they cry out to Moses, take away the snakes. But then he doesn't take away the snakes. Instead, he says, well, make a bronze serpent and put it up on a pole and have the people look to it. So if they're bitten, then they can look to the snake uh, on the pole and, and live. And that's what he does for us. We say, like, you know, take Satan away from us, take death away from us, take all these things away from us, take temptation away from us, take uh, our, our sin away from us. Well, obviously, he does take all those things, but not yet, I mean, proleptically. Uh, so he says, uh, well, I'm going to give you my son to suffer and die for you, and then you are going to receive him by the means of grace through faith, and yet you're still going to have to be in the lion's den. You're still going to have to deal with all these trials. I walk in danger all the way. Uh, I pass through trials all the way. Death doth pursue me all the way. Uh, but also, I walk with angels all the way. I walk uh, with Jesus all the way. My walk is heavenward all the way. So I think it is actually, a you know, when you slow down and read it, and you say, well, why? Why doesn't he just undo the, the Haman's edict? was like, why didn't God just undo the curse that he laid on Adam and Eve when they fell into sin? Well, he doesn't. Instead, he, he gives them that curse, but then he adds the promise of Christ. So I think that's what we're dealing with here. Mordecai, his edict is like the New Testament. It's like, the, it's, it's Christ. It's the gospel. Uh, it's, it's the means of grace, the preaching of the gospel and the sacraments. And Haman's edict is the fact that Satan is here and he's angry because his time is short and it's it's now or never. Uh, and I think it is really in a rise to arms with prayer employ you, oh Christians, lest the foe destroy you. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and those who cling to the word of God, to the, to the gospel win. Mm. As you were, you're talking about this reality that you know, we, why doesn't the Lord do an end with, do an end to all these things that we might want him to do an end with right now, the suffering, the, the work of the devil among us, our own sin, and, and the sense of its effects on us. Why, why? I don't, I don't know that scriptures ever do answer that question. Why? 
Rather, they, they point us to the, the way in which God provides us deliverance in the midst of those things. I was reminded of even the fact that Jesus acknowledges this reality, but and not only in the sense that he teaches his disciples, you know, don't be surprised when these things come upon you, but even he teaches this in, by way of prayer. So in what's sometimes called the high priestly prayer of John 17, this extended prayer that Jesus speaks on Monday, Thursday, before he is betrayed, this is John 17, verse 15. Jesus is praying here. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one, which is a, a striking thing that, so that, you know, why doesn't God do these things? I, I don't know that we know why, but to hear Jesus pray about it and, and specify, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. I'm not asking you to, to stop all of the, the work of the devil in, in this life right now, but keep them safe from him. I think it's, it's striking to hear that Jesus actually prays about that so that then we can have the comfort to know, well, the Father's going to answer his own son's prayer so that when we, we face this reality in the world, we can do so with, with courage and, and going to those gifts that God gives to us with, with great confidence and knowing that he will, in fact, deliver us from the evil one, even as we still are in this world, just as he had prayed about. Right. And all things work out to good for, for those who love God. Uh, <clears throat> it also shows that going through trials. Now, obviously, sin is always evil, and there's no benefit to sin. Um, so we don't say, well, I'm glad that I fell into sin. But you, right. w- w- the, the Scripture does say, I was glad that I was afflicted. Mm. Um, so and, uh, these actually are for our eternal benefit. We don't quite understand. Now, it's true that we are justified by Christ's righteousness. So the object of our righteousness that by which we're justified is Christ's righteousness alone, not the righteousness that we produce through our renewed self. However, the righteousness that is produced in us by our renewed self is for our eternal benefit. And we don't understand it entirely. Uh, we don't understand how uh, you know star will, will differ from star in glory, but we, should, we shouldn't spurn the trials that God permits us to go through in this life. Uh, because God works them out for good. And uh, his hidden will is kind of vindicated in our sight by his revealed will in Christ Jesus. Again, as St. As Saint Paul says in Romans 8, uh, that uh, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So th- that revealed will in Christ Jesus. And in this case, that revealed will in Mordecai's edict that's what strengthens them uh, against uh, this hidden will of, well, why is this other edict still there? Yeah, yeah. So we, we see how those two edicts play out, how the Lord works through Mordecai's edict to bring deliverance for his people. We're going to keep looking at this text more from Esther chapter 9 on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking to Pastor James Preuss this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Who does Lutheran Church Extension Fund serve, you ask? It's simple. We serve Lutheran Church Missouri Synod ministries and church workers with loans and ministry services. And it's faithful Lutherans like you, church members and church workers alike, investing with LCEF that makes it possible for LCEF to serve these ministries. Learn more at lcef.org. LCF is a nonprofit religious organization. Therefore, LCF investments are not FDIC insured bank deposit accounts. This is not an offer to sell investments or solicitation to buy. LCF will offer and sell its securities only in states where authorized. The offer is made solely by LCF's offering circular. Investors should carefully read the offering circular, which more fully describes associated risks. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Tuesday, July 2nd. We're studying Esther chapter 9, verses 1 to 19, with Pastor James Preuss. He serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Ottumwa, Iowa. 
Pastor Preuss, prior to the break, we were talking about this reality that there are two edicts in effect, both of them from King Ahasuerus carrying his authority. The one that was authored by Haman has allowed for the destruction of God's people. The one authored by Mordecai has allowed for the people of God to defend themselves from that destruction. And we see, as the text begins, that the reverse of what was expected, perhaps at least by Haman and his his people, occurred, that the people of God gain mastery over those who hate them. And this, this happens throughout the empire, and we hear as the as we recount or as is recounted what actually happened on that day, that no one can stand against the people of God. Fear had fallen on the people of the land because of the people of God, and even because of Mordecai as well. We start to see some of the elevation of Mordecai and the fear of him in this text. Uh, take us into how this plays out in those verses about three to five. Well, you have this fear uh, falling on both the people and on the leaders of the, of the people, the uh, the governmental officials, so that they side with Mordecai's edict instead of Haman's edict. And I think that's something that, you know, so there are only about <clears throat> two or three million Jews in this entire empire. It's a huge empire. They're spread out to kingdom come. And uh, <clears throat> so the, the people, and then you have millions and millions of other inhabitants uh, with thousands and thousands of other government officials. So they all have the choice, like, okay, so do we follow Haman's edict or do we follow Mordecai's edict, uh, which is more advantageous? And this is, again, like, I know God's name isn't uh, spoken, but this is something that when you read through, uh, you know, Judge uh, Joshua and Judges, like, you know, what does Rahab say to the two spies? She says, you know, the terror uh, 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 for Israel has fallen upon us. And God says to the people in, <clears throat> way back in uh, in uh, the books of Moses, like in, in, in Deuteronomy, where he says that, you know, I'll cause the people to be terrified of you when you come. And that's what he says to Joshua and then in Judges. And then, you know, it happens even in uh, First and Second uh, Samuel, where you have the terror of the people, of, of God's people falls upon them. So God isn't mentioned here, but he's obviously there. Why, are, why do the people fear Mordecai so much? Uh, now you can see it. You could see why they would make that decision by the fact that Haman was hanged, uh, or or how he was killed. Well, I'll, I'll get to that when they talk about his sons being being put up on a pole. Uh, but uh, yeah, that so that's that's what's uh, kind of remarkable here, and you see God's work there. Um, we just went through five, right? Yeah, thereabouts. Yeah, talk, okay. I mean, you yeah, keep okay. keep going as you as you see fit. I was just kind of okay. To... Well, yeah. I was just going to say in verse 6, and I'll talk about it again when you get to the, all these numbers. So when you talk about biblical uh, criticism, both higher and lower criticism. So higher criticism is talking about, well, you know, higher criticism, criticism teaches the Bible as if it's not actually uh, inspired by God, and it, then it's not authored by those which it claims to be authored by, so that you like any other book. So then they, they really just tear it apart. So I read on Wikipedia, which is a terrible place to get your information about the Bible, but they were talking about uh, the house of Omri, which if you don't remember, the Omri was Ahab's father. Uh, he, he's like the, the founder of Samaria. And they claim that he's the one who, his house is the one that brought the great wealth to Israel that the Bible attributes to Solomon, and that he's the one who introduced Yahweh worship and Yahweh cults in mm. Israel. And it's just just total garbage that these people say. Well, anyway, what one criticism that they'll have also in lower criticism, so lower textual criticism, is just simply dealing with the fact that these texts were copied by people, uh, and they made mistakes every once in a while, and they did. They even left out words. So, for example, the Hebrew text doesn't tell us how old Saul uh, was when he became king and how long he ruled. So we have to like look at the New Testament and the Septuagint to kind of figure that out. Uh, well, anyway, the one thing that they really don't like are these numbers. They think all the numbers are too many. Too many mm -hmm. people are crossing the, the Red Sea. Too many people are, are fighting in these battles. Too many people are dying in these battles. So I read Kyle Dalich. Those are two people, Kyle and Dalich, who wrote, what is that, 140 years ago, something like that? It's, yeah, it was um, in the 1800s, yeah. 1800s, yeah. And they, uh, 
So what they claim is that this is a very pr- plausible number uh, because they put the uh, the population of Susa at half a million inhabitants. Now, mm-hmm. I can't find anything anywhere that claims that Susa around 500 BC had a population of half a million people. Mm-hmm. And this is something that I think that modern archaeologists and scholars are just going to say, no, uh-uh, couldn't be. And they don't just do this with the Bible. They'll do this with other texts. So, for example, Shalmaneser III, uh, the emperor of, of Assyria, we actually have uh, documents. like They're like carved into stone or something, some tablets or something, where he talks about his conquest over Ahab. And he claims that Ahab, like Ahab had teamed up with uh, some Arab king. And he claimed that Ahab had 2,000 chariots. And I was reading this in the book, and this book said, uh, it said 200, but it had the footnote. And I was like, wow, this is really interesting. So I went to the footnote, and it said, well, it said 2,000, but he must have meant 200. So even with extra biblical uh, evidence, they'll say, well, no, he, there's no way that Ahab had 2,000 chariots. So I'm a bit of a, an alternative historian. I mean, not in like, you know, uh, <laughs> I have to be careful when I say that. That's right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but what I, what I mean is like I'm not an evolutionist. I believe that God created the Bible. I believe that these numbers that are in Scripture are correct. Although I will concede that it's possible that there are certain copyist errors here and there. But I do think that the authentic text has been has been preserved. Um, and I, I think that there is a bias uh, among 20th and 21st century and uh, obviously earlier uh, scholars that they, they couldn't have had these massive mm-hmm. numbers uh, back then. And I, I'm just not convinced. Now, granted, I'm not an archaeologist. I haven't been over there. I haven't looked at these sites. But I don't see why we have to be denied. Like, I have been to the uh, History Museum in London. I've seen the gates of, of, of Assyria and Babylon and such. And I don't know. The people who built that, could they not have uh, built cities that had hundreds of thousands of people? So anyway, as we deal with these numbers, I think that they're very plausible. I think that, the, I mean, this is what the text says. This is the Bible. So I think that they uh, could, could be very much be, be true. Although, that being said, I don't know if they had half a million people living in, in Susa. That's what Kyle Dalich claims. Sure. But, and, and, and regardless of that claim, I think what you're saying, though, the 500 that are killed, that we understand to be an accurate number of how many right. people were killed in Susa, 500. Yeah, on the first day, 500 were killed, and like some would claim, well, that's such a ridiculous number. Like even that, Doesn't like that's what people were, were, were. To me, I don't. I mean, well, that's what that's that's what Kyle uh, and Dalich were were working back against, and sure. then, uh, and then I mean, and definitely with like the 75,000, uh, that was being being kicked back against. But it's mm. it's just interesting because yeah, you don't think that's a ridiculous number, but then I'm reading this, and Kyle Dalich are. Uh, claiming that uh, that Susa has a population of at least half a million, and that the entire empire stretching from Ethiopia to India has a population of at least a hundred uh, million. Hmm. Now that's what they're claiming. I'm sure that there are others who are saying, "Oh, those are ridiculous numbers." But right. well, I would just caution the reader, especially if you're reading these critics, is these critics, all of them claim things that they couldn't actually know, and they're all more confident. Than they, uh, than they should be, and the most accurate numbers we possibly could have are those which are found in Holy Scripture. That's right. That's right. So, so five hundred people then are killed by the the people of God on this first day in Susa. Just, just briefly, uh, Pastor Price, I think it's important. You were talking about things that might trouble us from the from the Scriptures. You know, the Book of Esther doesn't mention God. The reality that you've got these two competing edicts, and God doesn't take the thing the one away. I think another thing that's that often troubles people when they read the scriptures is the reality that we see in this text that the people of God actually physically kill their enemies. Can you talk a little bit about the reality and why that's taking place here in Esther chapter 9? Well, God has the authority to kill and to make alive. Uh, and we see this throughout all of scripture that he does command them to kill people uh, that he has pronounced judgment on them. So God has pronounced judgment on these people. Uh Jesus says to Pilate, you would have no authority unless it were given to me, given to you from above. When Pilate says that he has the authority to crucify him, 
uh, St. Paul says in Romans 13 that he does, that the governing authorities do not bear the sword in vain, and that they've been given this by God. And, uh, and that's exactly what Mordecai has. Mordecai has the authority to do this. But also, if you read the edict itself, I mean, I don't see how anyone can claim that this is unjust, uh, even by human measures, because it's saying those who, let's see here, uh, the king allowed the Jews who are in every city to gather and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any, uh, any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and, and to plunder their goods. So we're talking about the forces that are trying to kill them and destroy them. Now, granted, they have the women and children included in there too, but I think that really is just showing... Uh, uh, this is the time that we're living in. Um, I mean, God, granted, God does have them completely obliterate certain people, including the women and children, uh, and like judges and such. So it could it could be that this is Mordecai writing this justly from God. It could also be though that uh, that you know Ahasuerus says put the women and children in there too, kind of like because uh, you know he's a brutal person. Because he also says and to plunder them, but you notice people don't plunder them. So that's kind of an interesting thing, too, yeah. that Mordecai wrote that they have the right to plunder, but then the people don't plunder. Right. Uh, so it could very well be that Mordecai is just simply, he's writing an edict, not only based on God's instruction, but also according to how edicts were written in those days. Sure. Uh, and because uh, they don't follow it word for word, and God's will ultimately is the one that's carried out, not just simply the edict word for word. Right. Yeah, I think that I think that makes a lot of sense that that Mordecai is is simply following traditions of his day when it comes to the writing of the edict and probably echoing language from Haman's edict which is being directly counteracted here in this and so I, that that also seems pretty reasonable to me. And I think as as you read this narrative carefully, what we're seeing is is not vengeance being put into the hands of God's people of their own volition, but rather, as you pointed out, this is the Lord at work through the means of, you know, ruling through governments for the protection of his people. This is this is a self-defense that's happening here, not a just out and out, hey, we're going to kill whoever we want. These are the enemies of God's people who, despite the death of Haman, want to kill God's people, and right. they have been given the right by this edict to defend themselves, and the numbers that are reported are them doing what has been given for them to defend themselves so that they do not lose their physical lives. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. It's, I think it's just important that we, we put that out there because otherwise, again, a book like this could be misunderstood and certainly misused in a number of ways if it's not rightly understood as to what's going on. So that's, that's the reality. But within the people that are mentioned specifically, we have, I'm not going to read their names again, but the 10 <laughs> sons of Haman. <laughs> are mentioned right. particularly as those who also die there in the, the city of Susa. And we find out a little bit, There's a as, as Esther gets another opportunity to make a request from Ahasuerus, she says something about the ten sons of Haman. So talk to us about those guys. Right. So, yeah, we can kind of skip o over that, uh, that th th they were, the ten sons of Haman were killed, and then they didn't take the plunder. And then Ahasuerus uh, says to Esther, like, you know, what? Uh, look what they've done. They've killed the 500,000. He gets this number. And then he says, what have they done for the whole uh, province? But now, you know, whatever you ask, I'll give you more. And then Esther says, well, give me another an additional day or give them an additional day in Susa, uh, which I think indicates that they were still fighting. Like they hadn't given up yet. There were 300 more people still uh, bearing arms. But what do we say about the 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 sons of Haman? Well, you mentioned earlier, uh, we were talking about uh, the serpent, about Satan, and then mm. his children. And it's an interesting thing. So God uh, says, uh, he put enmity between the woman and the serpent and between her seed and his seed. So what's the seed of the woman? Well, the seed of the woman is Christ Jesus, obviously. Well, who are the seed of Satan? Now, that's kind of a strange thing. I mean, he doesn't have seed. Angels cannot reproduce. Well, what does John the Baptist and Jesus call those who speak out against uh, Jesus? They call them brood of vipers, don't they? What are brood of vipers? Those are descendants. So those are the seed of the serpent. They're children of the devil. That's what he's talking about. So in this text, if uh, Mordecai is a Christ figure, 
then Haman certainly is a demonic figure, just as Goliath would be a, 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 a figure of Satan. So Haman is a figure of Satan. He is that snake, figuratively speaking, and his sons, these are the seed of the serpent who are at enmity with Christ. Which makes it very interesting, because then what does... They're already dead, and what does Esther ask? That they be hanged. Now, this is interesting. I'm sure you talked about it earlier because Haman's already been hanged. He, you know, built the gallows in the ESV. It's translated as gallows. Uh, the word is ha'itz, the tree. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of interesting. So it's a very vague term. Uh, we understand it as gallows. It could have been a pole. Uh, from what I've read, many understand this as they were either impaled, like, you know, Vlad the Impaler type of a thing, or that they were even crucified. Now, I'm not good enough of my historical knowledge to know whether the art of calling it art of crucifixion had been invented yet. I think it might may have been at this time, uh, but I think it's certainly uh, reasonable to believe that they may have been impaled. Regardless, they're lifted up on a tree. Uh, as, uh, as those who are cursed. So Deuteronomy 21, 22 to 23 says that uh, if anyone is hanged in, in Israel and the sun goes down, that they have to be taken down so that they wouldn't curse the land because curse is anyone who's hanged on a tree. And then St. Paul brings this up in Galatians 3, 13, saying you know, that Christ became a curse for us, as is written, curse is anyone who hangs on a tree. So there's so many things you can actually connect here I mean, you have, the, I mentioned earlier, the serpents biting the people of Israel, the, the fiery serpents, and God doesn't take them away, but rather he provides this tree uh, or this pole. Or he said, has Moses put a bronze serpent up on a pole for the people to look at? So Christ uh, takes on the image of our curse. So I don't, I'm not saying that the sons of Haman are figures of Christ by no means, but they certainly do remind us of how Christ became a curse and what that means, that Christ suffered on the cross for us. Haman's sons were evil. They were sons of their evil father, and they wanted to destroy the Jews just as Haman did, and even more so because their dad was killed and they lost their prestige because of the Jews, and they wanted them dead. Uh, they were evil. And now they are cursed, and they're up on a tree as they should be. As the thief, uh, the one thief said to the other thief on the cross, "You know, we are uh, we're, we are suffering justly." And then, what do we all have in our houses and in our churches? We have Christ up on a cross, and this is what we confess: uh, "On my heart and print thine image, blessed Jesus, uh, King of Grace. That by life's riches, cares, and pleasures never may your work erase. Let the, the clear inscription be: Jesus crucified for me." So Jesus is crucified. He is the one who's cursed on the cross. How can this be? This is offensive to our senses. Haman's sons should be crucified. The enemies of Christ should be lifted up on a tree. And yet our faith says that no, Christ is the one who is cursed for us. So I think this is a great juxtaposition uh, to the crucifixion of Christ to kind of get us in our heads uh, what is going on when we look at the crucifix. Yeah, absolutely. We we did in in chapter seven. We even talked a little bit about the gallows as as Haman's cross rather than Haman's stake or Haman's gallows. And to see, you know, particularly for Haman to be hanged there, it, that's exactly what he deserves. Then to see Christ take that, not because he deserved it, but because I deserved it, shows just the great the great love, the grace, the mercy, the compassion, the kindness that our Lord Jesus has for us, that he would go to that place, that cursed place that we rightly deserve, to, to hang there in our place. What, what mercy and grace. And now again, to see Haman's sons hanged on their crosses, similarly getting what they deserve, following in the footsteps of their father. Man, what, what a picture then to realize this is what my Lord Jesus has done for me and for my salvation, for this world, and for our salvation. He has gone to his cross to save us from this that we deserve. To, to be sure, a very a vivid image of the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
when we would consider these men hanging on their crosses. So uh, with that then in mind, the, the chapter as it, it r- r- wraps up, we come to the more figures. And just briefly, Pastor Price, I, I was doing a little bit of, while you were talking earlier about the numbers, just I was doing some quick internet searches for what this worth. Uh, according to, this is actually in the Guinness Book of World Records, in the Guinness okay. Book of World Records, at the height of the Persian Empire, there were almost 50 million people in the Persian Empire, which is not as as much as Kyle Dalich says, but again, these you know it's hard to estimate such things. But even if you even if you think that, so let's let's say that the, the Guinness Book of World Records is right, fifty million people in the Persian Empire at this time. For the city of Susa, then would if it was five hundred thousand, as Kyle Dalich should suggest, that would be one percent of the population of the Persian Empire. I did it. Another quick <laughs> math here. Currently, New York City, which is the biggest city in the United States, has about 2.5% of the United States population living in it. All that is to say, like the numbers that we're talking about and the way 75,000 men killed fits into it, I think it makes good sense if you just do a little bit of comparison. So, just yeah, I think so too. To back up what you were saying, yeah, and there are huge numbers you could play with 75,000 over 127 provinces. Yeah, uh, dividing that up, I mean, it. And they, there are a lot of major cities, uh, so yeah, it doesn't and around, even, even without the numbers. math. It doesn't do like it doesn't seem unreasonable to me by any stretch of the imagination. So no, while Bible do, Bible doubters love to do that, that's what you really learn uh, with with all this Bible doubting. And this is why, like, even with I know it's like a way off topic, but like the whole long ending of Mark. I mean, you guys just have to realize how much they deny everything in the bible and when you actually look at the arguments they're all weak they are all weak it's just it's just like they bring up objections that a reasonable reader is just like i don't really see the problem like what yeah why is that why is that a problem so yeah that's right okay so so we we find out then in the entirety of the persian empire Seventy-five thousand are those that are killed because they've been attacking the people of God, and the people of God have defended themselves against them. But again, the people of God are not laying hands on the plunder. This was happening on the thirteenth day of the month of Adar, and we find out that in kind of the country they took the fourteenth day then of the month as a day of feasting and gladness. In Susa, because of the ongoing conflict, as as you pointed out, the fighting actually takes place over two days. They rest and have the feasting and gladness on the 15th day. And it's from that that we're going to find out more in the, the next text. This Feast of Purim is is set in place. Uh, we got about two and a half minutes here, Pastor Preuss. Just kind of help us to wrap up our section, particularly as what we see the, the foundation of what happens for the, the inauguration of the Feast of Purim in the, the coming text. So uh, Purim is not a... a feast that we Christians normally celebrate. It's celebrated among the Jews today. Uh, yeah, it is a very ancient uh, celebration that's been celebrated since you know, the 470s or so BC, and it shows God's victory over his enemies. Uh, it teaches us, uh, as we learned, about the uh, how Christ being a curse for us, how big of a deal that is. It shows uh, how we deal with adversity here in this life and with the trials that God does not remove, uh, but we use what he has given us. So Mordecai's edict is the gospel, uh, and that's how we overcome uh, God's enemies. Uh, It shows that God preserved the messianic line. If Haman's plan succeeded, then uh, then David's and Jesus' lineage would have been wiped out. So it shows that God cares for his, his church. So I think Esther... It's a wonderful book for Christians to read, uh, learn, and inwardly digest uh, to learn how God's providence, that is God's almighty hand, uh, is, uh, is overall. He is protecting his church. He is protecting his Christians. He does not always remove uh, those things that we want to be removed, but he always gives us the, th- the things we need to overcome them. Um, you know, there's no temptation that is not common to man, and with temptation, also he also gives the way of escape. Uh, he he grants us uh, his holy word, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you suffer and died for our sins. He's given us baptism. He's given the, us the Lord's supper. So there is no attack from Satan. There's no sin. There's no uh, trial. There's no sickness 
that you as a Christian cannot overcome uh, by the much greater edict than Mordecai's, but the edict of Christ, which he gives in his blessed gospel. Pastor James Preuss serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Ottumwa, Iowa. He's been helping us today to study Esther chapter 9, verses 1 to 19. Pastor Preuss, thanks for being our guest today. Thank you. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about this section of Esther 9, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It is always a joy to hear from you. Join us tomorrow as we conclude Esther chapter 9 and the book of Esther to see how the people of God established the Feast of Purim. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.